Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a really special session. My name is Ralph Simon, and I'd like to introduce you, first of all, Megan Elliott. Megan is the founding director of the Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts, a big, big operation in Nebraska in the U.S. She's come specially from America to be with us. Uh, she also was one of the founders of Cross Media. Any of you know of what Cross Media was? It was one of the world's most distinguished digital media and entrepreneurship programs that was held across 22 cities in 14 countries. She is somebody that really knows where all the bodies are buried in terms of <laughs> entertainment, what goes on in terms of creating entertainment. Megan, welcome to London. Thank you. Thank you. Give her a big hand. Then all the way from Los Angeles, California, we have the founding member of one of the most important companies at the future of Web3. How many of you are familiar with Web3 versus Web2? Some of you are, well, we'll get into it in a little bit of detail, but Alex comes from a very distinguished background in the film, in the tech business, was with Lionsgate, the movie company, for some years, and now is responsible for running X Solar, X S O L L A, and X dot L A, a company that specializes in monetizing digital goods in video games and really one of the great specialists in the world in the fast emerging world of Web3. Alex Bakalov. Alex. And this is a very international grouping, all the way from Stockholm in Sweden. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Victor Friedel. Victor is uh, somebody that has also an extremely distinguished career. Victor is the executive producer of the huge ABBA show that is now on in London, which uh, they built their own arena, and we'll get into some of the details on that. Furthermore, uh, he is also uh, very involved in looking at developing new modern entertainment with Pop House. Pop House is the Swedish company that Victor is the CIO, but also the executive producer. Victor Friedel, welcome to COGX. So we have a really distinguished group, and of course to see all of you here uh, this morning, uh, it's a great pleasure. What we'd also like to uh, just say, uh, first of all, Megan, we'll start with yourself. Um, you run this important school which is on the same level as MIT or, or, or University of Southern California in terms of creating new talent. Uh, just tell us, first of all, a little, a little bit about the chirographic uh, period that we're in. Okay, yeah. Well, I believe that never before have storytellers and artists been so important to the world because we actually live in a chirological moment in time. We're at a crossroads and it's both terrifying and exciting. And it's terrifying because of what I call the three A's, and all of everyone on this panel will know what they are, automation, algorithms, and artificial intelligence. Routine jobs, even in the, in the entertainment industry, are being automated out of existence, and we haven't invented jobs yet that will replace them. And mass surveillance is also now intelligent, uh, so deep fakes. And we're fearful because there are currently no standards, testing rules, or codes of ethics for any of them. But on the other hand, we've never lived in a moment more thrilling. And I think the pandemic has shown us that not only has it been an accelerant to new modes of production and technologies using real-time collaboration tools, virtual production, uh, but we've also got hyper-connectivity everywhere. And that means that a place like Nebraska, a land-grant uh, land university research one, can be connected in a rhythmatic network of artists and technologists to the world. And I think that this time also calls out the absolute centrality of the emerging media artist because our technology is always emerging and it's these artists and storytellers who, are, um, who can use the actual digital tools that we have can help us make sense of it. That's what I think. <clears throat> so you're based in Nebraska mm -hmm. and Johnny Carson, who was the legendary American talk show host who really created the format, uh, the school is named after him. Yep. You've got some $60 million to fund what you're doing. You were brought in specially from Australia to run this, and your notion is to build this so that you can not only emulate but also surpass the kind of creative depth 
that you get coming out of the MIT Media Lab or schools like that. Is That's that right. And I've, I've actually just hired senior researchers from MIT to help me do that. So, yeah, our research, we're um, a Research One university. It's an undergraduate program. Uh, we teach students from foundations to code, design, tell stories and be entrepreneurs. And what are you finding in terms of this new generation? Are they storytellers with an understanding of tech or are they storytellers that need to have a dollop of tech smeared onto them? Uh, they have an understanding of tech. I think they need to understand story. Their criticality, learning to be critical thinkers and system thinkers is even more important than being technically proficient. They have that. We're beyond digital natives. You know, we're now beyond in a time of digital natives. fluency. Right. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. Okay, so thank you very much, Megan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you heard this straight from the heartland of America, but also more importantly, great creativity that is weaving together next generation of the future of entertainment. Because the future of entertainment is very, very much woven into data, technology, but you still need to have creativity. And talking about creativity, Victor, what a great pleasure to have you here. First of all, uh, you're in London. You've got an incredible success here in London. Just two weeks ago, you opened the ABBA show, if I could just say, Pop House, that you're a senior uh, team member of, uh, was actually founded by Björn Olveus from yes. ABBA and Connie Johnson, uh, going back to 2014. But uh, the group also owns and operates the ABBA Museum in Stockholm. Uh, the Pop House Hotel, um, Circus, Hasselbacken, and a great new space in Stockholm called Space. So first of all, just give us a little bit of a sense. When you opened the ABBA show, and I understand you've sold over 300,000 tickets. 400,000. 400,000 tickets, and you've been open for two weeks. Yeah, we sold 380,000 tickets before we opened. So that was a Western record, uh, or you know, we're not really part of the Western, but we like to think that we are uh, in terms of uh, competition. Uh, and it was, yeah, amazing response here in the UK and uh, the press worldwide, except for Sweden, actually. You, uh, Swedish press didn't really get it, uh, but uh, that was not big a surprise for us. Um, and, uh, you know, tremendous response. Uh, I've been there for five nights. Uh, so I've seen it five times, and it's as good every night. It's actually better because the audiences, the word is spreading that you, if you dress up, you know, it's even more fun. Uh, so people are just really connecting to the avatars. Okay, so now <clears throat> here are a couple of questions. First of all, the development of the production. You brought in George Lucas's company, Industrial Light and Magic, in That's California to help you with some of the special features. You've got computerized lighting. Give us some sense of how you constructed the production elements because effectively it looks like ABBA, it feels like ABBA, it smells like ABBA, but... And it sounds like ABBA. It sounds like ABBA. But, and I think the, uh, what it is is that it is ABBA. I mean, that's why ILM came in to help us because we, we had them just before COVID hit uh, Sweden. We had a secret studio rented in Stockholm. We had about 100 people from ILM coming in with all their only guys with computers, and then we had the four live ABBAs performing all the songs in their, you know, now 70s, um, with the capture image suits on. So it's their movement, it's their mimics. Uh, Bjorn and Benny had to shave off the beard, that was a deal breaker, uh, almost a deal breaker. So we had to create a fake beard for, for one of them. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it is them, and I think that's, um, how you really, you go for it, you, you merge the, the real abbas with the avatars, or create the avatars with the tech that is just beautiful. And then, as you said, with the lightning um, and everything that, so you, you actually go for it. But the point is, you've got very, very tight synchronization of all of the lighting. It's all done with computer linkage of Sp spotlighting, specific spotlighting in a large arena. What's the capacity of the arena that you built? Uh, 3,000 people, exactly. Okay, so those 3,000 people that are included within, you also built the world's largest high-resolution color screen. Yes. To my knowledge, it's the biggest one. And what is the size there. of it? It's about 44 meters wide and 10 meters tall, and uh, almost two times 8K in terms of resolution. And are you using hologrammatic characters? 
avatars, so to speak? Uh, yes, but they are uh, in the screen. It's, it's hard to understand. Even, you know, really smart people that come there, they don't really get what is that they see. Uh -huh. I think once you let go of that, maybe with the help of some, I don't know, a beer or a glass of champagne, <laughs> then you you relax more. And, and then you, you actually, my wife, for instance, when I took her, uh, she got to attend the premiere, uh, she's been, she's almost a bit Amish, sorry about that, but she's like, she, she doesn't like tech, uh, which is weird in our relationship, because I love it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she, after one song, she was like, I love this, it's them, you know, and she grew up even more with ABBA than I did. And, and so in terms of the way that the show actually works, you have a live band behind the screen. No, they're actually in, in front of the screen. And sometimes they are there, and sometimes they are not there. Uh, but they always are playing. So you hear live music that's behind the vocals of ABBA. Yes. So that reinforces the fact that they are playing live, they Absolutely. are there. That's a big thing for, for Bjorn and Benny and, and, uh, and the girls, as they call them, <laughs> for Frida and, and Agneta, that, it's, that it's, it's live. And they have been training for the last two years, handpicked by Bjorn and Benny. And um, sounds amazing. Uh, I would say actually, last time I saw it, it was the best. So it's it's actually changing also. Uh, they can't do big improvs uh, because everything is, you know, then the lightning and everything wouldn't work. But uh, it's in terms of how tight it sounds, it's it's amazing. So <clears throat> there've been reports that it's cost 140 million dollars to put the show on. You're looking at a four-year run in London. You're looking at developing spaces elsewhere. Tell us about space that you opened in Stockholm and why that's an important uh, new environment. Yeah, for, for us, for Pop House, it's, uh, we see ourselves almost like an investment company in, in tech or in, in more of entertainment. So we, are, um, we opened space uh, last November, December in Stockholm, a little bit due to COVID. And it's the largest gaming center in the world. We call it the Digital Culture Center. Uh, so it's seven floors in the sky rise. In the, if you throw a dart at Stockholm, it's basically bullseye. Wow. That's Saga's story. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, more than 400 computer stations, beautiful specialized computers uh, where you can both consume a lot of uh, games and other, uh, other uh, content types, but you can also learn how to create. And I think that's where, you know, Meg and I uh, sort of found a common path. We, we lure them in with the gaming, but uh, now when it's school break in, in Sweden, we have, you come in for one crown, basically, what's that, like uh, 10p, you can come in and you could uh, play for eight hours. And then you come in, uh, if you're a kid, and you sit there and play, and you see something going on over there. What's that? Well, that's actually something called Space Academy, where you can learn how to uh, embrace tech into, so you, there's motivational speakers, there's teachers that can help you to code Scratch or Python, uh, sort of early introduction to, to coding. And um, people, we, we all know that there's, even though there's a lot of people here today, we're lacking a lot of tech people in, in the industry. So the games industry as such, which we know is six times bigger than the global movie business, very, very important. So your focus is all about gamification of both technology and entertainment. You've got uh, an Avicii experience, which you've developed in Stockholm. Yeah, as you said, we come from the ABBA Museum uh, out of Björn's uh, well, heritage. But then we also now have created an Avicii Museum. We call it the Avicii Experience, together with his parents, uh, to, um, to celebrate the, the joyfulness and the playfulness that Tim Burling, uh, also known as Avicii, um, used when he developed what we now know as global anthems. So Pop House are really looking at investing in taking established entertainment artists and then building some kind of cross-media, multimedia, uh, electronic, technological, gaming-related something. Can you speak about some of the prospects that you're looking at or just give us some sense uh, of... The only thing that we have announced so far is that we have acquired the rights for Swedish House Mafia. Swedish House Mafia. Yeah, Swedish House Mafia. And then uh, I would love to tell you more, uh, but hopefully in a couple of weeks we can, or uh, we hope to announce at least five major global acquisitions this, this year. Incredible. And this is all coming out of the Pop House. Coming out of Pop House. Pop.
Just like that. Making things pop. Very good. Well, that's a good segue into Alex Barkalov, the uh, founding partner of XSolar and X.LA. Alex, you heard about uh, the video game industry and how incredibly huge it is. Tell us about XSolar and Web3 and what you do in terms of really maximizing revenues in gaming and games. Thank you very much, Ralph, and great to be here. Um, so, um, Exolo is a company founded in 2005, and it is uh, today the largest uh, game fint fintech company. So, we have 700 uh, global payment methods, everything from obviously all the credit cards to uh, all the unique methods in each geography of the world. Um, and so, we're a multi billion dollar company doing that. So you can think of us as the Shopify of the games world, because it's also marketing support and all of that. So if you're a very large game maker, like you know, Epic Games, Fortnite, um, or Roblox, uh, to 4,000 others, they're all our partners. 4,000 games developers? Yes, yes. So we're, we're, they we're the most extensive in the world. And so we, our ecosystem is about 300 million players. So, and what's interesting about that in now that we enter into the Web3 space is that we all, everyone in this room, of course, knows NFTs and uh, what is happening in crypto. Unfortunately, not a very good week for, for that right now, but, <coughs> but, um, but really the, the, the fact remains that only about um, 3, million NFT, 3 million wallets, crypto wallets, um, have ever purchased an NFT. And that is... That is a very gen generous high rank in, for, if looking at all the data. Uh, and yet there are three billion um, creators online or gamers online. So how do you go from three million to three billion and what's the disconnect? Three million does not sound very big in the world that we play in here. Um, so the problem is that it's very complex outside of the techie groups that we're all in. If we're very tech-minded and we know about um, you know, creating the wallet and connecting to various chains and funding the wallet and uh, stored value cards and KYC forms and all of this sort of thing. It is daunting for a lot of people. So in Web2, we can just use our own payment methods. And so we can also um, utilize uh, all sorts of processes for digital asset management systems. So you can buy an NFT, um, we could host it for you, walletless or lazy mint it for you, and then when you're ready to create uh, your own wallet um, or take it off into cold storage with a, with a you know, USB ledger, uh, you can absolutely do that. Um, or you can do that from the very get-go. But we are uh, using this as a way to scale to the billions from the millions. I would say that's, that's a big part of what we're doing. So let me give you a case in point. You've got some, uh, some gamers from all over the world that are playing, say, Clash of Clans or Assassin's Creed or uh, one of the uh, Grand Theft Auto, one of the major games, and you want to buy digital goods in a game. Would Web3 be more effective than, say, buying a digital game through, say, an Amazon uh, uh, platform. Just give us a sense of how Web3 works to monetize the digital purchase of goods that would then go to the owner of the game that gives them a basis for being able to develop a whole array of interesting digital goods. Right. So, so gaming audience is one of the audiences of several audiences, by the way. So I just want to clarify that we serve um, the creators. We're reaching out to uh, a, a many uh, uh, enterprise studios, film companies, that is, um, uh, music labels, et cetera, et cetera. We want the whole creator audience to partner with us. The idea being that game, the game audience is also a very important one. What happens in the game audience, to answer your question, Ralph, is that a lot of virtual goods have already been purchased. And this is a very touchy subject uh, for very serious game players. They don't want Web3 more or less invading their space. They don't want game dynamics uh, um, affected. However, they bought so many virtual goods. Wouldn't it be great to also monetize those virtual goods, be able to trade them out? So this is, this is one of the things that we're doing even in the games world, but especially in all the creative uh, areas that we're going to be 
uh, partnering with. So Megan, when you hear what Alex has spoken about and hear Victor and the extraordinary production and production values, when you spoke earlier about nomadic artists, storytellers, technologists, when you hear these comments, obviously you've got to cast an eye on the future because you're training the people that Victor says there's a great shortage on a global basis for, and certainly here at COGX, we're very familiar with what's needed to drive the business forward. What's your impression when you hear about what Alex is doing and what Victor has so incredibly done? Yeah. <laughs> is there a complete need for interdisciplinarity, almost post-disciplinary artists and technologists? And the way that we approach teaching code as artists is fundamentally different, right? So that we, we teach people to code so that they're actually creating something, that it's about an expression of their creativity. I think it's why I've been so successful in getting women into our school and, and gr graduating them and having them being engaged in both... Um, actually getting uh, double majors in maths or in science, not just emerging media arts. So that's really interesting. The other thing is about creating um, students or graduates who don't feel siloed within industries. I think traditional film television schools, they're really, I learn game engines so I can make virtual production for movies, or I learn game engines and I'm going to go in the game industry and I don't want to be involved in the movie industry. And we've been really successful where our students don't even really mind what the output is, you know, as long as it's about in service of the creativity, and that's completely unusual for us. And what they're finding here in the UK, where they need 60,000 workers in film and television and virtual production over the next wow. five years, they're not able to find students who have learned how to use a game engine to work for Epic. They, keep, they want to work for Epic, they don't want to work for film and television, whereas our students are being facile with both. So, for example, someone who wants to work with Unity, is that, for, and where you say you're also building new audiences for traditional art forms, people come for an extended reality XR, a hackathon, and then stay for the dance exactly. after the hackathon. Yeah, we've got, the, we've got dance in our, in, our, um, in our center, and that's what happens. Computer scientists come in and they are in for the hackathon, but then they actually learn about these traditional forms of theater as well. And I think it's interesting what you're saying too about the theatrical experience of Voyager and your wife who uh, prefers more traditional, less techy things, it's actually, as, you, as you've clearly done, is engaging with, the, with people from theatrical backgrounds and with live theatre is what we need to drive it forward and find these new audiences. Yeah. So, Victor, when you hear what uh, Megan has to say, and certainly Alex and the whole gaming thing, and you, with your emphasis on gaming, even though you're very deeply embedded in the music space, Tell us what you're seeing in terms of uh, the way that you developed the technology when you were with Industrial Light and Magic in Marin County in California, Northern California, and looking at what's going to really tickle and tease someone's deep interest in, a, in a, an entertainment product so that you get a sense of ownership of wanting to be part of it. What, what are you, how do you do your A&R, or what I call I&R, innovation and uh, research? Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to hire both of you. Uh, so, we, you know, to, to, to the next thing. Here we are. Uh, Cogex does it again. We're, we're always, uh, we, we've stopped talking about NFTs. We're talking about Web3 now because it's just easier to, um, to understand for everyone. Uh, so that's extremely important. I think if we would have launched ABBA Voyage next year, mostly all the tickets would have been on the blockchain. Um, Unfortunately, we couldn't do it now, but hopefully in a, in a year we can do it. Um, also, uh, I'm thinking, well, there's so much thing going on here. Um, I think when it's, it's the same amount of people in Sweden that is uh, missing as in the UK. We're talking about 75,000 people that we need to have before 2025. Um, uh, and... It, we know, you know, we have to do everything we can in order to uh, to maintain that kind of innovational spirit that we have. Um, and when we talk about tech, we're not only talking about tech as um, we, we talk that we're powered by technology, but we're also inspired by technology. Some of the great things that are coming out of tech today can also help to inspire storytelling and and uh, do things that were not possible before. And coming back to ILM, I think why ABBA Voyage is working is because it's so well done and uh, somebody said that uh, 
ILM told, um, told the, the producers, Svana and Ludwig, uh, that if they would have known what they were about to go into, they would have said no. Because if they do a Star Wars movie, it's like an arm and a lightsaber, just milliseconds, it's a lot of quick things. Now it's four live representations of humans for a full show. And they That's number, a two-hour show. It's, yeah. Plus minus. Yeah, plus minus a little bit. And it's, um, uh, it's a major undertaking. And all the shadows, the hair, and then working with people that actually have, you know, I don't really like how I look there. And that's about 100, you know, 100K to just render that. <laughs> so, 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 so we try to keep the, the avas out of it. And, and Bjorn is really focused on lip syncing. Uh, so he wants it to be absolutely lip synced everything. And then, uh, as you know, uh, he should be. He's an artist and a professional. Um, and then somebody said, well, you know, at concerts on the big uh, side screen, screens, uh, normally it's always a little bit of a lag. But it, this is not a concert, Bjorn said. You know, this is a, a, this is a totally different thing. So it needs to be 100% lip synced. So we, um, we're still tweaking the show, uh, but it's, uh, it's a, well, hopefully we can take this uh, after London or even before. Uh, that's the great thing with avatars. They can perform in different places around the world at the same time. Uh, nobody really cares, and I'm not mm -hmm. being judgmental now, but nobody will notice if we replace the drummer. Uh, yeah, but true. we can't replace the Abbas. Uh, but we could have one, for instance, in, in Vegas uh, at the same time as here in London. So where this is a great move away from what was a classic example of Tupac Shakur and... Um, and, uh, and The hologram, yeah, the, at Coachella. The biggie, Biggie Smalls. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently Roy Orbison did a hologrammatic tour of the UK. But this is on a much, much enhanced technological scale. This yeah. is completely different. It's, it's, it's so much changer. more in terms of using SAS within the framework of building the format, the narrative of the live experience. Yes, and, that, and that's uh, absolutely right. Also one of the reasons why uh, we decided to create our own venue, because there's no, the 3,000 seats, there are no cheap seats, uh, and there are no, like, you, you have a good... A viewing angle from everywhere. from everywhere. So we needed to control the room. Right. I think that's what uh, the whole team has done beautifully. So I can see there's some professionals in the audience here. Dennis, I'm sure it would be lovely just to build a venue somewhere in London for this. Alex, <clears throat> you tell us a little bit about um, some more about uh, X.LA and also you very friendly with the son of Frank Zappa, Ahmed Zappa, who himself has been very experienced in developing these kinds of uh, uh, electronic and technologically enhanced performances. But tell us a little bit more about what your platform can do to help emerging entertainment forms. Give us an idea. Right. Uh, so, again, to add more clarity in terms of um, what Web3 is, it's yeah. the ownership economy. It's passing the gig economy where... So, is Amazon the gig economy? Uh, Uber. Uber. Uh, TaskRabbit, um, uh, Airbnb. Right. Um, so the ownership economy is a very humanistic vision. So your creators, you know, whether they be coders and game creators, or also you can write a script, or you could write, uh, uh, you can take wonderful photographic images, or you could, uh, you know, pen an article. Um, you are creating something of value, especially in the creative world. The issue has been in the past that um, if you own part of it, as in you sign, you have underlying rights, well, um, unless you're very famous and have a lot of revenue that's generating from that, um, it's hard to get access to any revenue. Um, and even if you do, then there's the issue of, well, you need lawyers and accountants and all that to go and find it and get it and make sure they comply. In the blockchain, it's all recorded and it's all open ledger, so we can operate in a trustless society. That's a very important thing. And to that end, we are a revenue sharing protocol for the, the Web3 world, for the creative industry. That's, we, are, we have 50 initiatives that we've invested in. Give We're us an example of what they are. So we have initiatives that have a lot to do with performance space as well. Uh, we have initiatives that have to do with 
creators becoming their own record labels uh, as opposed to um, record labels themselves. So for up and coming musicians, we have a, a, another project for story writers where um, you can become your own publisher and you know, so we're investing heavily in that and we're basically uh, connecting with a lot of uh, very, very well-known writers and, um, and also creating a, a user-generated content uh, platform for that as well. Um, and so the idea being that you can write an article, that could be fiction, that could be a business article, that could be uh, any kind of narrative you like. You can enable nano transactions. So you can pay, you know, one pence or one penny, or whatever the amount would be, continue reading, and it's yours forever if you're the reader. Uh, so that's an example of things that were not easy to do in Web 2 environment because of the lack of efficiencies. But now we can do those sorts of things. We, what are you seeing in terms of the video game and the esports areas that are in this kind of threshold uh, area, uh, point? Well, <clears throat> so esports has been a very, very... Uh, big thing, and uh, but unfortunately, the traditional world hasn't recognized esports as as big as it is, and as powerful, and as the ability to cross fertilize. And so, big ad agencies are starting to recognize that, and advertising will be a big part of that. Um, obviously, the great influencers that have come that are you know big gamers. We're we're partnered with a few of these. So, um, and so we're going to develop um, uh, esports, uh, you know, pavilions and esports venues for, as well for that. So what do you think of that, Victor? Love it. I mean, we, uh, we were happy to be host the, at Space in Stockholm. We just hosted the f final of uh, FIFA. Uh, they're still called FIFA. I know they have some. Electronic but, yeah. Arts. The so, former no, electronic, electronic Arts. So, no, Electronic Arts and FIFA. So we hosted the, the championship now. And... Um, uh, much, I mean, they, they loved coming to us because we have all this, the stage and the LEDs and the cameras, lighting, everything. Uh, we thought of a lot of things, not everything, but we have everything in an arena in the same venue as space. Um, and uh, uh, it's interesting to see, you, you mentioned that it's six times the, the money that it, movie it's business. the movie industry. And uh, it's uh, amazing. This was an American production company doing it and they were 200 people they still uh, thought covid was on so we had a lockdown and uh, but they're super serious and actually more professional than a lot of other productions that we host in our venues uh, and it's just because it's more money into it they can't fail <clears throat> so i've got a question for all three of you <clears throat> there's a plan at the moment next year 2023 to create what would be the world's first ever Olympiad of video games and esports. Not Olympiad, Elympiad, as in esports. And of course, if you play esports as a team member, FaZe Clan, 100 Thieves, Team Liquid, some of the big teams, uh, you are known as an esports athlete. You're not even recorded record as a player. So if one was going to be developing an Olympiad, what would you say? should be included within that because you need to do a venue of it. Obviously, uh, Dubai and the United, the Emirates, very keen to bring something like that. Stockholm now obviously becomes a, an important point. Do you think that that's a good idea? Yes, and, and I think that having lived through several Olympiads in Sydney, London and Beijing, actually, um, uh, alongside every Olympics, there is a cultural Olympiad. Right. So it should also include a cultural Olympiad. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. And in terms of the major publishers of games, do you have contact with the major game publishers? I mean, you yes. mentioned Electronic yeah. Arts, but um, Alex, how about you? Yes, no, we, those are our partners in Exola. And in, so Exola is a traditional games platform company, so we have all those relationships with, you know, the major ones. You mean and like Activision Blizzard now owned by Microsoft, who paid $69 billion to buy the platform. Exactly. Well, any more? Any more? Uh, Which other publishers are important? Oh, the, you know, all the way from Fortnite, so Epic Games, to Roblox, to uh, Take-Two Interactive. Oh, yes, Take-Two. So Two, we good. have all those as, as partners and since 2005. So that's, uh, that's our partner base. And 4,000 others, as I mentioned. But those, those are the pretty major ones. So it's, it's, it's an interesting alliance 
between the publishers that want to release new games features um, and this now creator audience or influencer audience that wants to participate, and we can be the enabler of saying, how do we create value? Well, we do it with the ref share protocol. You do something um, to help play this game, we can basically create a, a medium of value exchange. We can drop, again, you know, NFTs. We could uh, drop revenue, you know, utility NFTs. We can enable experiences. So if you do this, then you get to go do that and create that sort of system logic. So uh, any number of things like that. What's your general view about NFTs? Do you think it's uh, in the early hype stage? Do you think it's a real product? Do you think it's got uh, staying power? I th I, yeah, absolutely got staying power. I think it's more interesting the technology with the blockchain actually that, uh, than uh, the, the hype and the, uh, what's been going on with you know, some artwork that has you know, amassed a lot of value and then fallen down and up again. Uh, I think it's interesting to, to, uh, to see where the ownership comes in. Uh, we also talk a lot about soul-bound uh, ownership, so uh, something that you actually get in a game that is tied to you. And there's no monetary interest, but it's very something that you could that you could um, that you could show off, or that you could have on. Uh, even you're allowed to print a T-shirt if you have this. You're allowed to print a T-shirt in our store. Um, so it's it's more it's more of a, a token uh, of affection to a game or something. Right. And then what's interesting, what you said, Alex, when if, if you stop playing a game, uh, you amassed a lot of you know, swords or whatever in that game, but maybe you stop playing the game, but you still want to bring them with you. That's how the ownership of Web3 comes in. So you can actually take them out of the game and bring them not to a new game, but still have them with you as sort of digital tokens of your life. And there's, uh, uh, interesting, if, you, if this E-Olympiad would, uh, would go uh, in, in the UAE, of course they have tons of hotel rooms, but the gaming community is so much larger, and not That's everybody right. can be there. So it should also, of course, be hosted in the, some sort of metaverse, okay. uh, so that everyone is allowed in. Uh, I think that could be a really inclusive uh, thing to do. Well, it's interesting, in India and with Bollywood, of course, Bollywood makes twice the number of movies a year than Hollywood, <clears throat> and um, collectibles of NFTs is a huge thing for Bollywood stars, which uh, uh, well-known companies in India, one particular, Hungama Digital, very important company doing that. Um, so, Megan, when you hear all of this stuff, obviously you live in the world of optimism because you're building talent that is making stuff for the future. What do you think about what you've heard today from Alex and from Victor? I think it's amazing. Our students have been experimenting with minting their own NFTs. They're really not interested until proof of stake becomes much more widely accepted and Ethereum's about to launch theirs any time now uh, because they, they have real concerns about the impact on the environment of what blockchain and NFTs do. So we had real pushback from, from not just our students but from other students as well um, to engage in this space. Yeah. Alex? Yes, very good point, Megan, because basically uh, the consensus mechanism has been very woefully you know, inefficient um, and now the whole idea is how do we make it a greater transaction throughput yeah. to yeah. allow it to be greener, um, to allow it to also be uh, more accessible? And, and the issue right now is, great, go connect, you know, go link cross chains and all that, and that creates all sorts of insecurities of which we've all heard a lot about. But a lot of that is gonna be fundamentally changed by one company, in fact, that we're, you know, like we're working with like Layer Zero, for instance, as a good example. Um, layer you, zero. Layer zero, yes. So, uh, so every blockchain is a layer one. Some people do scaling with what's called a layer two. So you could get out of the blockchain, do you know, quick calculations, and then record to the blockchain. But then bridges are another way that people work, but we've seen what's happened in some cases recently. So there's ways of burning the tokens as you transfer to another chain as well. So we're, we're experimenting with all of those things. And then we're going to become a layer one as well. So we own, as Exola, we own 100% of XLA, but we want to be own, we want to own 0% in five years because we're going to basically let all the creative industries um, just own and we're going to be a multi-chain DAO, 
So that's multi-chain DAO. Yes, which is the decentralized autonomous organization, right. and we're exploring all the ways to create the society and the governance and sub-governance models. But anyways, that's all technical talk um, for saying you know how we're going to evolve. But um, getting back to NFTs for one second, it's just started. And to Victor's point, the utility aspect of an NFT is going to be so greatly expanded in terms of being able to not just, um, not just have a provenance for artwork, but to be able to say, this is what you can do. This is how much you're owed. These are things, these are experiences that you've been to. You've, you've, you're recording uh, and, you know, and uh, memorializing uh, important aspects of, of what you're doing. In a way, you can have a t-shirt that says, I am an NFT. You know, so this is how it's going to expand. So even though it's a narrowly defined word at the moment or phrase, it is going to greatly expand yeah. and allow the, you know, to be a central part of the experiences that you're creating. So here's something. Spotify have now got 93 million songs on their platform. Um, people's time is challenged. Of course, we're living in a time famine. But with what you're seeing with entertainment, and of course the need for people to have personalized forms of entertainment, you personalized ABBA, personalized Avicii, personalized space, whatever it might be, are you finding that uh, you've still got to come up with new ways of actually presenting the entertainment in such a way that you can blend esports and gaming and other elements to weave in the kind of technologies that people now take for granted in modern life? Uh, that's a good question. I think maybe what we do is faking it a little bit. We just take elements of other type of businesses that are more mature in, in, in certain areas and we bring it into it, entertainment. Right. So it's not really rocket science. I mean, we, what we do is that we elevate, you know, if you have a song on Spotify, automatically it will increase in play. Uh, just to the fact that there are more people getting connected in the world right. to, uh, to musical uh, stream platforms. Uh, so it's freemium or premium, doesn't really matter. It's, you're going to earn more money over time. What we try to do is that we're trying to get things that are a little bit, uh, where the curve is not sort of taken off yet, and we amplify it with, it could be a Netflix show or a musical or things that we know, and we do marketing activities and around that and trying to just get that, uh, that trajectory to go up a little bit higher. So this is not rocket science, it's rock it science. You've got to rock it. That's right. Correct? Okay. okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard it from the real true specialists of the future. These are people who are showing a signpost into how you take your technology or your entertainment content project or platform and build it into such a way that you plant the seeds of something that will get you a great audience. I'd like you to please give a really warm round of applause to Megan. Thanks so much for coming all the way from Nebraska. <laughs> Alex Barkaloff all the way from Hollywood and LA and La La Land. And thank you so much, Alex. Great to hear about Web3. And Victor, just thank you so much for giving us an insight into this extraordinary project. Obviously, you've sold 400,000 tickets. If anybody here wants to get to see the show, what do they do now? Uh, you talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen. I want one. He wants one. Everybody wants one. I hope you all got your COGEX hats that were on the chair. There's some still available on the front here. Make sure that you wear them. Cognition X is a wonderful event. Charlie Muirhead, you've done a great job. We'd like to ask if we could go to that initial slide, please, of the people that are on this session. And then, Daniel, if we can take a picture, because I know that these... Ah, there we are. Take a picture. If we could stand on the edge of the stage, because this is something to take to Nebraska, <laughs> to take to Los Angeles, and to take to Stockholm. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming and being here. Thank you very much. Yes, let's take a couple of questions. Okay. Why don't you say, what's your name and where are you from? So what opportunities and plans are there? Because you've only talked, in my view, about the virtual world. So 
So what opportunities are there to connect those two worlds? Really connect them? It's, it's already happening. Well, I mean, most of the football teams, uh, soccer teams in, in Sweden or handball teams, they actually have eSport teams as well. So, because uh, you can't play, uh, even if you exercise a lot, you can't exercise 24-7. So you can then go into, from, from your training, you can go onto the computer and vice versa. And they have uh, balanced schedules for that. So uh, many of the real eSport teams today, they are as physical as any other sports team. To, to your effect, when it comes to uh, to the Olympiads or e Olympiads, uh, you have coaches, you have physical trainers, and everything. So, uh, as uh, maybe a little bit of an older generation, we'd like to think sometimes that you know computer games are just you know uh, nerds sitting around eating pizza and, and uh, drinking <laughs> you know uh, Red Bull. That's not the case anymore. I mean, the, right. so it's uh, it's it's a different story, and uh, I think that's uh, a little bit mindset just needs to change with parents and, and everyone else. I would make in just quickly because yeah, we... Sure. So yes, everything is about real to meta integration. So it is not just the metaverse where you see everything virtualized. It is the idea that everything you do in the real world the, uh, gets recorded, transacted, and your relationship with whatever it is. Even, even amongst here, amongst ourselves. But yeah, it's the real to meta integration. We started with a lady, we will end with a lady, this uh, lady in red. Tell us your name, where you're from, and please ask our specialist. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sophia, I run a company called Tech for Non-Techies, and we have an awesome Tech for Non-Techies podcast, which you, which you should all listen to. So my question is about NFTs. Um, there have been issues about fraud uh, on NFTs, which is basically shadow trading. So for those who don't know, shadow trading is, for example, I make an NFT. Uh, imagine we are great friends. So you buy my NFT, I buy it back. And so it looks like there's lots of trading activity. So the price goes up, but really it's just the two of us. And then, you know, all these unsuspecting people buy it. And then we stop trading it. We make loads of money. And your question is? So what... Are, are your artists, are the people that you're working with, are they concerned about shadow trading? And are there any initiatives? Are you maybe working on shadow trading? Because it is, it is a really big concern, obviously. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a very, it's a very good point because the types of fraud, and that's one type of fraud that happens in this world, is very different than the Web 2 types of fraud and the way that it's, a, let's call it logical fraud. There is... As, you know, people can hack into your bank account. Um, that's Web 2 fraud. Here, they can legally steal money. Everything is just code. This code says execute this, and it does it. And you can do nothing about it if that code says to do that. So then somebody could do um, do any sorts of like uh, you know shadow minting or, or any any number of of uh, things like that. It's about improving the code, the underlying code, and preventing these things. We're looking at um, middleware architectures to help along to basically say, let's put a wrapper on this. Uh, for instance, you buy an automobile with a code, right? And we don't seem to have these codes in it yet, but we're going to be creating that. It's an evolution. Um, and we're going, to see, we're going to seal up the ways in which... Here's another thing. Even when they steal that, or, or let's just say people steal um, large amounts of money, we know where they are, and they can't trade it out. And so it's, it's a very strange new kind, new kind of fraud era, but it's, it's logical you know, issues that need to be fixed. I think we've run out of time. Okay. Our clock, uh, we'll pick up that question with you, Alan, immediately after this. But, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Rima, thank you very, very much. Great to see you here, and enjoy COGX.